Well, good evening, dear friends. It's great to see you tonight. Hope you've had a pleasant day today. But you know what? Not every day is pleasant, is it? You ever get frustrated with life and even frustrated in your relationship with God? You ever just throw up your hands and say, God, what do you want from me? You ever do that? There was a young fellow who was a new convert, and he was kind of a quirky fellow. But he liked to say to people, especially to his friends, just remember, Jesus loves me and Jesus loves you. But if you get a little bit upset with a friend, he would say with a deadpan, straight face, but joking, he would say, just remember, Jesus loves me and he doesn't even much like you at all. And this young man, just like some of us have done, he would throw up his hands sometimes. He'd look at the sky and cry out to God and say, God, what do you want from me? He was actually fussing at God a little bit. And he may have got that from King David. King David, that's something he often did. God, why are you doing this? Why are you treating me this way? What does God want? What does he want from you and what does he want from me? We've asked that question at one time or another. Nearly all of us have, I suppose. It's a question that's as old as the world. And in one of the most powerful verses in the Bible, it is answered. It's in the book of Micah, in Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8. Micah 6, verse 8. We're going to be reading the book of Micah in just about a week and a half. Right now we're finishing up the book of Isaiah this week and next, and then I think about next Wednesday or Thursday, we start in the book of Micah. It's a relatively short book. It's one of the minor prophets. Micah, of course, is an Old Testament prophet. He was a prophet to the people of Judah, and he served God during the reign of Jotham, Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. And by the way, King Hezekiah is a good king. He's one who responded well to the preaching of Micah. He was a contemporary of Isaiah. And Micah's name is unusual. His name is actually a question. His name is a rhetorical question. Micah means... Who is like Jehovah? And of course, there is no one like Jehovah. But he has a message. And in the book of Micah, it's a message of condemnation of the sins of God's people. God's people were treating one another badly, especially those people who were poor and needy, the widows. They were treated in a terrible way. Many of them were being defrauded and, and oppressed. And Micah's message is to call the people back to moral and ethical conduct. Now, the answer to the question, what does God want, is found in Micah 6 and verse 8. He has shown you, O man. And by saying he has shown you, this is nothing new. And it's nothing new tonight any more than it was new back in this time 2,700 years ago. God had already shown the people what he wanted. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be answering this question and looking at these three elements of this answer from Micah 6 and verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? Now, you need to see the context in which this is written, and I am... I'm persuaded that a lot of people misunderstand the, con the context. The context is one where the prophet has gone through a whole long list of things that the people are doing wrong. And he has rebuked their sin. The answer, this answer to the question, comes from what the people responded to Micah with. If you back up just a couple of verses to verse number 6, in verse 6, the people are asking this question, With what shall I come before the Lord, and how shall I bow myself before the high God? I want to please God, so what do I need to bring to God? That's the question. How shall I bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with 
thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Now, when they start out asking, when the people are asking, what, what's going to please God? What shall I bring to Him? What they mention in the beginning is really reasonable things. Shall I come to Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? That was part of the Old Testament sacrificial system. But then they get silly about it. They start exaggerating, and they talk about how unreasonable they think God is. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? You'd have to be a mighty rich man to offer thousands of rams. Will he be pleased with 10,000 rivers of oil? You see, now they're exaggerating and they're getting ridiculous. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Maybe God wants me to offer my child to him. And really what they're in effect saying is, you can't please God no matter what you do. It is impossible to please him. And I will tell you, my friends, this is often the way hypocrites and habitual sinners speak about God. Well, you just can't please God no matter what you do. And you look at all the stuff that's in the list. If you make a list of these things as they're asking the question, okay, how shall I come before God? Shall I bow myself before the high God? Shall I offer him burnt offerings? Shall I give him calves that are a year old? Will he be pleased with thousands of rams? There's five things. 10,000 rivers of oil, that's six. Give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. They offer at least seven things. But it's interesting what is not in this list. There's not a word here about repentance. There's not a word here about reforming their lives. There's nothing about changing the way they were living. That's the sad thing. They're just acting like, you know, no matter what you do, you can't please God. I mean, we can make all these sacrifices, but it's not going to help because it's impossible to please Him. Now, these were religious people, and they offered their rituals, but their rituals were meaningless. Why? Because their hearts were haughty. They were arrogant. They were self-righteous. And I think they're blaspheming God. Yes, they had religious rituals, but their hearts and their hands were unclean and their walk with God was compromised by the wickedness of this world. I think they were tired of serving God and yet they weren't really serving Him at all. The message of Micah, 2,700 years old, but is still relevant today because there are some folks here and there who still carry this attitude. Now, I'm going to believe better things about you and believe that you do not have this attitude that says, no matter what you do, you can't please God. I think better of you. But we still need to know about these three things that are found in the answer. What does the Lord require of you is the question that is asked. And the first thing that is found in the answer, the first thing that is found in Micah's answer is to do justly. Now, you may have a different translation that says to do justice. Justly and justice are essentially the same things. Justice is typically either a verb or a noun. It can be used either way. Justly is an adverb. An adverb, its function in a sentence is to modify the verb. It's talking about how you do something. Now, why, does it, why is it worded this way? To do justly. That's what God requires of you. Well, it has to do with how you treat other people. Look at the next verses that follow. In verse number 9, in verse number 9, it says, The Lord's voice cries to the city, Wisdom shall see your name. That is, just judgment is being pronounced because the people were not doing justly, and judgment is going to come upon the people. The people will recognize that this is the name of the Lord that is doing this. God says, Hear the rod. Who has appointed it? Judgment is coming. You know where it came from? It came from God. That's the point that's being made. Are there yet treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked? And the short measure that is an abomination, that is in the weights and measures, people would say, well, I will give you one shekel of this and two of these and so on. But they were cheating. They were cheating with the weights and measures. 
a shekel that they used to balance on the scale was less than a shekel. And so they would cheat others. He goes on to say in verse 11, Shall I count pure those with the wicked scales and with the bag of deceitful weights? For her rich men are full of violence. Her inhabitants have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. So what do you see? How are they treating other people? Treating other people with lies, cheating them, wicked scales, all of these things here. And God says, I'm not going to count these people as being pure. And so the word justly here has to do with how they were treating other people. It has to do with the manner in which they treated others. And what we have here is God telling us what he wants. He wants us to treat others with justice. Treat others justly. God wants us to do the right thing. Our God himself is a God of justice. I'm looking back to the Old Testament to some more passages. First is Psalm number 89. Psalm 89 and verse number 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Our God reigns. He sits on his throne. But he is a just God. When it says righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, it's saying that these things are fundamental to God himself. I'm going to Psalm number 33. In Psalm number 33 and in verse 5, it says he loves, talking about God. Start in verse 4. The word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. God loves justice. And I don't think he's talking necessarily about himself there, but he's talking about how he loves to see justice in others. And then back in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and in verse number 18. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 18, it says that God administers justice. And that's what we've got going on in the book of Micah. God is going to administer justice to the people of Jerusalem or in the city of Jerusalem because of the way they were cheating and lying about how they were balancing or having faulty scales and unjust weights. God was going to administer justice. That meant that he was going to bring judgment upon those who were doing those crooked things. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 18, He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Now I'm going to go to, to Psalm number 72, Psalm 72, and in verse number 2. Psalm 72, and in verse 2. And here, God requires that we be people who do justly to one another. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. And so God is going to judge with justice, and that means that indeed we must be people who operate in that way. I'm looking at Psalm 106, Psalm 106 and verse number 3, and there the text says, Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. So God promises blessing to those who do justly to others, those who treat others in the right way. That's what the text says. Now I'm going to go to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 23, and I want you to see verse 23. It's an interesting comparison and parallel in Matthew chapter 23. When you get over there, you're going to recognize this verse and recognize it quickly because it's a verse that we often talk about when we look at how the Pharisees were carrying on their business. And Jesus does not speak kindly of the Pharisees when he speaks of them. This is Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. I'm sorry. You pay on, I was reading 27. So many of these verses start off the very same way. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Verse 23 is the one I want. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin. Those were things that were required under the law. Whatever harvest you made, whatever profit you made in anything, you owed the tithe. The word tithe means 10%. And so here are these little herbs that grew uh, maybe around their, uh, around the, the doorway to their house, little herbs that grew maybe around the, a fence or a gate. When they picked these herbs, it would be kind of like, I know that uh, my grandmother, she used to go out to the fence 
and she knew which greens to pull. There were wild greens that were growing, and she would pick those, and she would, she would fix a mess of greens. Wouldn't have to buy them or anything. They just grew wild, and that's the way it was uh, in Israel. They had mint, anise, and cumin. These were just herbs that grew, sometimes grew wild, and, and when the Jews, when they when they harvested some of these, pulled them up, they were careful to give 10% to God. That's what the law required. And when the Pharisees did that, they did the right thing. They were supposed to give that. But now listen to the rest of it. He said in verse 23 of Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These ought you to have done without leaving the others undone. Yes, you should have paid tithe of men, anise, and cumin. But what you have done, you have left some things out that you should not have left out. You see, the Pharisees neglected these very things that are found in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. In fact, I think all three things that are found in Micah are also found in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. So I'm going to list justice as one of those things that the Pharisees had neglected. And you don't need to read very much of Matthew chapter 23 to see how they were cheating widows, how they were deceivers, they were corrupt in their hearts. Jesus rebuked them for neglecting these weightier matters of the law. But what we will see is the same three things found in Micah are found here in Matthew chapter 23, in the text where Jesus condemns the Pharisees. And so in our daily interactions with others, God requires us to do justly, to treat people with justice in all of our relationships, whether it's spiritual, social, business dealings, whatever they might be, we treat people properly. We do not lie, cheat, steal, or defraud or hurt others. That's one of the things that God requires of you. He requires it of me. He required it of his people in Micah, and he required it of the people of God before Micah was ever born. He has shown you, O oh man, what will please him. And so the idea is that these principles have always been there. Now, the second thing, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly and to love mercy? It's interesting that in the Bible there are two terms that are often found together, grace and mercy, often found together. You look at verses like 2 John verse 3, the little book of 2 John verse 3, and there are several examples of this where John speaks to the people and he says, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father. Why would grace, mercy, and peace be with them from God? Well, because in it, look at the first two verses of, of the little book of 2 John. John the elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not only I but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Because these people were abiding in the truth and the truth was abiding in them, he now says to these people, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. And he goes on in verse 4 to say, I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. So people who were walking in truth were people who could expect to receive mercy from God. But I, I said that I want you to notice in verse 3 that grace and mercy are found together, and that's very common. Grace is God's favor to us. It is what we do not deserve. That's a disposition or an attitude of God. Mercy is the result of grace when God does not give us what we deserve. So the two terms are not exactly synonymous, but they often go together. I, re I remember reading a story 40-some years ago, and it was about a mother during the Napoleonic Wars, which would be a little over 200 years ago. And this mother's son was about to be executed by Napoleon. He was one of Napoleon's soldiers, but he had committed a number of offenses and he was about to be executed. And the mother went to Napoleon and appealed for his life. And she said, I want you to have mercy upon my son. Napoleon replied, your son has committed a third offense and he does not 
deserve mercy. And the mother said, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. Mercy is something that we do not deserve. When God's mercy is bestowed upon us, we can't say, well, that's what I deserve. No, if we get what we deserve, we're in trouble. It would not be mercy if he deserved it. And Napoleon said, then I will have mercy. And the young man's life was spared. Remember the publican who went up to the temple to pray. Remember Luke 18, verse 13. What did he say? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And and it's kind of interesting that when that publican went up to pray, he did not try to justify himself and say, well, I know I've done some things wrong, but no, there was nothing. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And God was merciful to him. This man did not try to justify himself. He made no appeal except to appeal to God's mercy. And God was merciful to him. And now, the scripture says that we should love mercy. Do you love the mercy that has come to you from God? If you've been forgiven of your sins, God has been merciful to you. And of course we love that. We love to be forgiven. But that's not what this verse is about. This verse, ladies and gentlemen, is about us being merciful to others. And we're not merciful to others because they deserve it. Because if they deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. Mercy is something that is given that is undeserved. How are the Pharisees doing on this? Remember our text that we looked at a moment ago, Matthew 23, 23, you pay tithe of men, anise and cumin, but you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy. See, this is a parallel. Matthew 23 is a parallel. It shows what you should not do. This is what the Pharisees were doing. These are things you should not do is to withhold justice from others, withhold mercy from others. These two verses, these two texts, have a parallel. The one says do it, the Pharisees didn't do it. The one says love mercy, the Pharisees did not love mercy. There's another verse, oh, there's plenty of verses on mercy. I suppose we could spend the rest of the hour. Remember Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16? Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain what? Mercy. That's talking about us going to God in prayer. If in the last hour, in the last five hours, the last five days, if you've gone to God and you have prayed for the forgiveness of your sins, then what you've done, you've gone before the throne of grace and you've asked God to be merciful to you. And we're good at receiving mercy, but if we want to receive mercy, we must extend mercy to others. I must extend mercy to my friends. I extend mercy even to my enemies. I certainly extend mercy to my brethren because I want God's mercy to be extended to me. Because of God's grace, we have received His mercy. And He says, now show that to others. Mercy in most cases means forgiveness. Sometimes mercy can just mean being kind to others. In fact, I think there's one translation that says to do justly and to love kindness. Mercy is an act of kindness. Would you say that our God has been kind to us in extending mercy and forgiveness? Of course. Of course. Now, that's what we should do with other people. We should be kind to them in extending mercy and forgiveness. And remember Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. If you have the Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount memorized, you know what Matthew 5, 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall what? Obtain or receive mercy. That's right. Blessed are the merciful, and they, for they shall obtain mercy. And what that's saying is that you need to be merciful to other people if you want God to be merciful to you. It's just that plain. Sometimes you hear people say very foolish things. I would not forgive that woman the longest day I live. I would never forgive her. You don't know what she's done to me. She may have done some horrible thing to you. Or it may have been some man who did some horrible thing to you. 
But when they come to you appealing for mercy, you need to treat them with kindness and be merciful. Why? Because you want God to be merciful to you. It's a pretty simple principle. And then we've got one other phrase. What does the Lord require of you? He has showed you, old man, it is to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Someone says, now that's not what it says over in Matthew 23, because there it said justice, mercy, and faith. But I'm going to put faith there anyway because that's what it means to walk humbly with your God. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7? We walk by faith, not by sight. To walk with God is to walk with faith. The scriptures often use the metaphor of walking to describe the Christian life, to describe our relationship to God. To walk with God means to go in the same direction as God. It means to trust Him, to walk with Him in faith. And so walking is a metaphor for faith and the actions of faith. And if walking is a metaphor for faith, then Micah 6, 8 and Matthew 23, 23 are essentially saying the same thing. Can you see how faith and walking humbly with your God, that that's essentially the same thing? It's just different words describing the same principle. To walk with God is to share the same purpose as God. It means to appreciate God to cherish the fellowship that we have with God, to be obedient to God. It means that we have the same spiritual, spiritual objectives as God. And what does this require in order for us to do this? It was something the Pharisees did not have. If you want to walk in faith, walk with God in faith, there's something required. What is it? It's there in the text in Micah. What is it? What is it? Do you see it, anybody? It says to walk humbly with your God. It requires humility. And what this means is, I don't have all the answers to everything, but God does. And I'm going to be obedient to Him. While I think maybe I can get ahead in this world by these unfair balances and by lying and cheating and so on, no, no, no. That's silly thinking, and that'll get us in trouble with God and cause all kinds of conflict. That's the way the Pharisees were. You know, the Pharisees, just read Matthew 23. They are a picture of a people who do not do justly, who have no mercy and are not walking with God at all, humbly or otherwise. The Pharisees were arrogant. They believed they were better than everybody else. Back in the book of Isaiah, there's a passage that points to that Pharisaic attitude. And in the King James Version, I like the way it's worded, We are holier than thou. We're better than you. That kind of arrogance. People who walk humbly with God do not carry that kind of arrogant attitude. We are humble. That means we forego our own ideas, our personal opinions, our prideful ways. If you're going to walk humbly with God, there can be no arrogance toward God. There can be no arrogance toward other people. These people in the book of Micah, They were arrogant against God. They were saying, what does God want? You can't ever please Him, no matter how much you do. Give Him 10,000 rivers of oil. It's not going to please God because it's just impossible. And that's sad that people would think like that. These three qualities from the book of Micah, they do not comprise an exclusive list. That is, this is not all that God requires of us, but these are big umbrellas. And under these three big umbrellas, are a lot of other things. These are foundational requirements in order that we would please God. That's what God wants from you, from me, from everyone. And so we need to examine ourselves in the light of these three things. And in the light of these three things, how do you come out? And you know who the preacher preaches to first? He has to preach to himself. I have to examine myself. And I will be plain with you on some of these things I have failed from time to time. I have to acknowledge that because that's the truth. Preachers do not get up and preach because they've lived a perfect life or that they're presently, their life has no mistakes or or fumbles or errors. I have to examine myself first, but I'm asking you now to examine yourself. And is it possible that one or more of us 
might be like the Pharisees in need of repentance, might be like the people of Micah's time in need of repentance. Remember what that list of seven things that we found? Well, they said, okay, we're going to come before God and we're going to offer uh, a lamb of the first year and we're going to do this, do this, do this. What does God want? Remember what they did not have in the list? There was nothing about reformation, nothing about repentance, nothing about changing their conduct. And that's what God wants. God wants us to walk humbly, to love mercy. And to love and do justice. Walk humbly with God, love mercy, and to do justice toward, toward others. That's our study for tonight. Maybe someone looks at their life and says, I need to make some changes. Well, that's great. Maybe I do too. Let's make whatever changes are necessary so that we can be all that our God wants us to be. Maybe the changes you need to make are just between you and God. Maybe it has to do with your disposition or attitude. Nobody has to know about that except you and God, and you need to talk to God about that. Maybe there's some conflict that you've got with another person. Maybe it's someone in your family. Maybe, maybe a friend or whoever it might be. Take care of that. Or maybe there's something you need to address publicly. And if that's the case, we're going to invite you to come in just a moment. But maybe there's someone here tonight that says, you know, I need to start my walk with God. And I'm ready to do that tonight. I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm ready to say so. I'm ready to repent of my sin and obey Jesus in baptism. If you'll do that. The Lord will receive you on his terms. Now you can walk with God in humility, justice, and mercy. If you would do that tonight, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing. Come now, please.